jurisdiction over government owned and controlled corporations. The public officers constituting the government of the controlled corporation, Your Honor, yes. Are you not going to make a distinction? Uh, I would say, Your Honor, that just a guess, Your Honor. Um, I'm not sure of this, but those performing purely public functions and not proprietary functions. <clears throat> How about the Boy Scout of the Philippines? As the Ombudsman? No, Your Honor. Over the... No, Your Honor, because uh, I think uh, the funds of the Boy Scout of the Philippines comes from private funds donations. Are you familiar with the decision of the Supreme Court regarding the John and the leader of the Boy Scout of the Philippines? No, oh, Your Honor. No. It's already a Supreme Court decision. How about the Philippine Red Cross? Same with uh, the Boy Scout, Your Honor, because uh, most of the funds coming, going into the Red Cross are private funds or donations coming. It that the yo the Boy Scout of the Philippines the OCC with original charter. I am not aware, Your Honor. You are not aware. I am a Cub Scout, but not a Boy Scout. <laughs> but you have not been informed of that. <laughs> mentioned the case of Socrates earlier. Can you uh, repeat the what is your understanding of the Socrates decision? In that case, Your Honor, uh, Socrates, uh, Mayor Socrates, called by a petition for the call. Now, in the recall election, <laughs> Mayor uh, Socrates contested the hug return for filing a certificate of candidacy, saying that uh, he's already completed his term and that is a continuation of his term. According to the Supreme Court, Your Honor, that no, it's not the case because there was a vacuum and it was an involuntary vacuum because it, uh, Socrates uh, was recalled. There was a recall election and during that gap, uh, it is not considered a continuation of the term of mayor. Are you familiar with the case of Senator Pimentel? Protests against his... Uh, Right now, Your Honor? Yes. Yes, Your Honor. Uh, oh. Yes, the family crew, Your Honor. But he can run? Yes, Your Honor. For another term? Yes, Your Honor. It's not that a third term. Do you agree with the uh, family uh, If you will be appointed in the Supreme Court. In the Supreme Court. Any case? Agree with the court. As I've said, <coughs> as I've said earlier, Your Honor, um, the decision is uh, part of the legal system of the Philippines, and I have to follow it. That's the decision of the Comel. How about your personal opinion? Remember, Pimentel was elected in two thousand seven. He protested. Uh, but it was Senator Subiri who was proclaimed. He, won the, he filed the protest and Senator Pimentel won in 2011. 
2011. I don't think my personal opinion, Your Honor, will come because of that decision of the Supreme Court in uh, Socrates versus Aguilar. Is there a vacuum here? Yes, Your Honor, there is a vacuum. Uh, and it's not an important Senator, Senator Subir is shot in the Senate. Yes, Your Honor. Oh, there was no vacuum. During the time, Your facto. Honor, during the time, Your Honor, uh, Senator Pimentel was not acting as a senator because of that. Uh, he lost accordingly on the basis of the elections that time, Your Honor. So there was an involuntary vacuum in so far as Senator so he as But he assumed in 2011. Yes, Your Honor. He was serving the first term. Just for a uh, several months, Your Honor, he assumed. So if uh, he, he served for several months, he did not complete the first term? Is that your I opinion I would say so, Your Honor. Um, it's not a continuation of the term. Why not? was involuntary on the part of, I think the uh, uh, recording word is, Your Honor, whether or not it's voluntary or involuntary. And uh, the uh, vacuum is involuntary in that case, Your Honor. Uh, how do you distinguish a term from a tenure? Your Honor, a term is fixed while the tenure is the period by which a uh, public official renders his service, Your Honor. If, for example, uh, uh, public official dies, Your Honor, that's the tenure. It is up to them. So, uh, the service of Senator Menta during the first term was not a service of the term? First term? Yes. Completed the first term, Your Honor. Completed. And yes, then he ran for re-election re and he won. Yes, he served the second term. Yes, Your Honor. So, can he run for a third term? Because you said he completed the first term. And then he completed the second term. Can he run for the third term? That allowed under our Constitution. He ran, but he lost, Your Honor, according to lost? Si Pimentel as against uh, Senator uh, Subiri. The, this last election. Ah, this last election, oh, Your Honor. Third term. This is the third term. They're the winner. Uh, yes, Your Honor. Oh. Either the... It's a third term, Your Honor. It's a third term. Okay, let's take it again. <laughs> Just an opinion. Okay, another uh, situation. A house, the House of Representatives, a former governor, was found guilty of grave misconduct by the office of the Ombudsman. The case stemmed from an unauthorized contract that he entered into when he was still serving as a governor. Such the the office of the Ombudsman ordered his dismissal from the service. The said dismissal order carried with it the accessory penalties of perpetual disqualification from holding public office, cancellation of eligibility, and for future of retirement benefits. Congressman Jose moved for reconsideration of the ruling, but the office of the Ombudsman denied the same. On motion, the office of the Ombudsman, by the way, it became final. On motion, the office of the Ombudsman ordered the Speaker of the House of Representatives to enforce the dismissal order against Congressman Jose. The Speaker refused, arguing that under the 1987 Constitution, there is nothing among its provision that authorizes the Ombudsman to discipline any mem member of Congress. Question, can the order of dismissal by the office of the Ombudsman be implemented against Congressman Jose for an offense that he committed during his incumbency as a local elective official? I don't think so, Your Honor, because the House of Representatives is an 
dependent body, Your Honor, just like the uh, uh, judiciary and the office of the president. president. Ruling that carried with it the accessory penalties of perpetual disqualification from holding public office. Implementation on that uh, perpetual absolute disqualification from holding public office. It's not the seat in Congress a public office. But, uh, Your Honor, uh, if my memory serves me right, I think the implementing authority there would be the House of Representatives. Yes, the, uh, the Office of the Ombudsman or the Speaker. Yes. implement the decision. If the speaker will have to implement it for it, Your Honor, to push through. Otherwise, Your Honor, the Ombudsman will have to file a case against the speaker. You have been aware of the Rappler case? Yes, Your Honor. Oh, what is a PDR? Uh, <clears throat> I think a PDR is security, Your Honor, by a holder uh, which is, he has the option either to sell or hold on to it, but it is not a certificate of ownership. And, uh, Your Honor, he only gets a uh, uh, dividends from an underlying share representing the uh, the PDR owner. What is uh, when is a um, uh, holder uh, liable for tax? Whenever he gets the uh, dividends coming from the underlying share represented by the PDR owner. How about the transfer? Uh, I, I, yes, Your Honor, if there is a transfer and there, there is a gain, if uh, the holder chooses the option to sell his rights to the underlying share, Your Honor, I think it's taxable. The rule on accumulation of uh, profits or dividends in taxation. Uh, we will be handling cases, uh, uh, tax cases in the Supreme If my memory serves me right, Your Honor, I think uh, in taxation you cannot hold on to at least 100% of the minimum paid up of uh, the, 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 uh, the income, Your Honor, of the corporation. Depending 100%. Um, you can hold in excess of that, but it should be used for business purposes. And you have to show that uh, it is for business purposes. What are the two tests for that? But have you not heard of the Bardal formula? Cases. No, more no more of appeals. But you have started the jurisdiction of the city. Before you are no, I was this interview. No, you are No. Because you will be handling cases decided by the PTA. Anyway, I will not go on. Those will be all. Thank you very much. Thank you, Yana. Thank you, Justice Alameda. We wish you si Chief. Patawag mo si Chief.
Tony Gadula, we'll just be waiting for the, we're just waiting for the chief justice. To be interviewed next, Your Honors, is Dr. Jeremy Benigno I. Gatdula. Good morning, uh, Dean Gatdula, or which, which title do you prefer to be called by? Um, well, hopefully justice, but for, for now, uh, <laughs> doc doctor is fine. <laughs> be careful of what you whisper. <laughs> <laughs> That's a dangerous thing. Anyway, uh, you've been in the academy for some time. Uh, what were your specialties uh, as far as law subjects are concerned? Um, the, speci the specializations I had or the focus of, of teaching that I had proceeded from the work that I was actually doing 
um, I did a substantial amount of work on the World Trade Organization and ASEAN. And so um, it naturally flowed that a lot of my teaching would be on international law, economic law, trade law. Okay, so how long have you been engaged in that kind of uh, specialization? Um, shortly after I was uh, I graduated from Cambridge, uh, I took up international law there uh, and made a focus on uh, economic law. I came back sometime around 2000-2001 and then the Department of Trade um, was looking around for a new um, special counsel to, to advise them. Um, the, 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 the legal counsel they had at that time was outgoing and uh, in, fortuitously enough, or interestingly enough, it was um, uh, later on uh, Chief Justice uh, Lourdes Reno who was on the way out and I was uh, tasked to or asked to come in to fill in the, the vacancy. All right, previous to today, you had, you have had no experience as a judge or a quasi-judicial uh, uh, officer. All your life, you have been uh, a bureaucrat or an academician. Will that be a correct characterization of your past in the law? Uh, I would say more of a practicing lawyer who also happened to be teaching and uh, who would also be uh, affiliated with the media because of the column that I would be writing with Business World. Um, and so um, I think for my entire career, I'd be straddling almost all of those uh, areas. And most of the time, I also would be asked to help government, particularly with the Department of Trade uh, and also the Department of Foreign Affairs. So um, in, in a way, I would be having a foot, or I would be spending uh, literally, for example, my days um, in academia one morning, and then in the afternoon in government, and then in business um, in, in some other parts of the day. Um, it, it's, a, I think, a little bit of a unique experience I, I had, uh, but that, I think, is the, uh, if, if, uh, with all respect, I think a better characterization of my career. Okay. Um, if you were to join the Supreme Court as a member, uh, what do you expect to do there? Will you involve yourself only with the matters of international law, or will you also show interest in uh, other areas of constitutional law? Um, I've, I've always been, um, well, I have been teaching, my, my, my focus on teaching is in international law, but I have been working on constitutional areas, particularly in the matter of rights and also in civil liberties. Um, I, I would think in all the areas of the Constitution, I would try to uh, make myself useful. Um, definitely we have each other's focus of, or areas of expertise, but um, I think the duty of a Supreme Court Justice is really to be able to uphold the Constitution, and that's what I seek to do. Okay. Okay, let me focus on that a little bit. Uh, you are aware of these two terms, judicial restraint and uh, uh, judicial activism. Will you in, uh, acquaint us with what is uh, your uh, uh, take on uh, judicial activism first? Well, I feel, uh, in a word, it's undemocratic. That's the reason why I, uh, I am not... Undemocratic? Prepared. Yes, Your Honor. Activism. Judicial activism. Um, why is that? Well, the Constitution, I think, was drafted by the people in a certain way with a certain meaning. And I think the duty of the, uh, the court is essentially to uphold whatever it is that the wisdom of the people at that time when the Constitution was being made, uh, it, to be able to uphold it or push for it. I, I don't think, uh, with all due respect to the, to the member of the, of the body that I hope to join, that it is not within the purview or their um, mandated duty to create something or legislate or dwell okay. in policy. Maybe that answer suggests that you believe judicial activism infers that you depart from the letter of the Constitution. Is that your uh, meaning? Um, yes, yes, Your Honor. Although I do, uh, of course, realize that there are some words in the Constitution that are, uh, uh, that are drafted or are meant to be, um, in a way, open to uh, interpretation to a certain extent by the judiciary. But um, the judicial activist that I know of, the one that, for example, um, Justice, uh, Chief Justice uh, Rehnquist was, was uh, uh, frowning upon, is one wherein the, the, the judiciary is substituting its wisdom already 
um, in rather than that of the wisdom of the legislature, which is the elected branch of government. But is not the task, the primary task of Congress, uh, of the Supreme Court, uh, the the power of judicial review? Um, yeah. And if that task uh, was to be fulfilled, uh, the Supreme Court cannot be hampered by the letter of the law? Um, Your Honor, I, uh, in, in terms of with regard to judicial review, um, well, first of all, there's a long history about that. When we're talking about due process, of course, it started first with essentially procedural due process, and through time it became um, uh, expanded to including a power of judicial review to check on other branches of government. But um, with regard to the phrase that you meant, that you uh, uttered, and that is unhampered, I think, uh, with all due respect, I have to disagree. There is a certain limitation built in the Constitution, either thematically, philosophically, and also with the words that are contained there. There was a very good lecture that was made by Dean Panganiban before the Philippine Judicial Academy, which I have No, to I am asking your opinion, your view, not the opinion of Panganiban or any other uh, jurist. I would like to know what you think about these things and if we have the same understanding of these terms because that is what we value in the court, independence. Um, also, as I want to say, I agree with that. And actually, a lot of the things that Dean Pangaliban was uttering in that lecture, I have been writing about. I would about rather avoid uh, referring to any other uh, person. You should be an island okay. when you join the court. Uh, and if you were to be an island, you should be an independent island. You should not be taking your signals from other people, especially those who have spoken. Okay. Um, I, I was about to say, so, Your Honor, sorry, that I had been writing a long time before on the, <coughs> um, on the downsides of uh, judicial activism. And I had been writing and teaching and preaching for a long time on the merits of the judicial um, responsibility to stick to the theme, no, okay. the text. And I, I, I get your drift. Uh, if you were to show or to insist that you are not that uh, keen to uh, going towards judicial activism, are you therefore a conservative? Um, Conservative. Do we yeah. have the same uh, understanding of these terms? Uh, conservative, uh, conservative, sir, in the sense that I would like to uphold the, the text and what has been written in the Constitution. I, I believe that what, if there is a need to amend the Constitution or a, uh, a modern need that needs to be addressed, it is better left to the people to directly uh, re uh, revise the Constitution or the Congress to make the policy call rather than the, uh, the court. Um, there was something that, and I hope you don't mind because you mentioned uh, not to utter names, but I've always um, ad uh, agreed with what Chief Justice John Roberts once said in his own confirmation hearings. The, the, the Supreme Court is essentially a referee. Nobody's interested in the okay. referee. So okay, I, I, I do not like, it's not that I hate these people. No? I do not. I love them. But uh, my whole point is knowing what is, what are you? What are you going to contribute? The potential that you have for the court. Because the court right now is, uh, uh, well, it's a powerful uh, institution. And I don't like to ever risk bringing you there if you cannot uh, contribute to that power. Uh, I am sure that you are prepared for this. But you must be uh, saying things uh, that would reflect who you are and what you will be. Otherwise, you have no place there. Because you will only be a mouthpiece of somebody else whom we do not like, maybe, or agree with. Now, going back to what you said, undemocratic, I am very intrigued by that. What do you mean by undemocratic? Are you saying that uh, judicial activism should not have no part at all in a Republican democracy like ours? Especially if you have three par departments of government. Um, I, I was talking of uh, judicial activism in the more extreme sense. As I mentioned earlier, there are certain portions in the Constitution, like, for example, the Due Process Clause, the Equal Protection Clause, which lets, lends itself to some sort of flexibility on the part of the judiciary. But I think that there are, some, um, uh, there are uh, provisions there that are pointedly that needs to be carried out precisely because the people, when they, when they author the Constitution, they meant it to be, uh, they agreed to ratify it in a certain way. And I think what, and it would be undemocratic 
for five Supreme Court justices, because that would be a majority of a quorum, to overturn the will, the will of the people or the well, will of the do not, uh, I think your, uh, your track is a uh, legal theory of uh, the Supreme Court being an unelected counter-majoritarian institution. All right? But let's not go as deep as that. I am just interested to know if you were willing to read the intent more than the letter of the law. Uh, my understanding is that when you are a judicial activist, you are not going to respect the boundaries that you seem to see in the letter of the law. But you would rather go behind the law and determine the spirit, the intent of that law. That is all what judges should be. Not to be literal about the law, but to be uh, open-minded about the reason for that law, the spirit of that law. Are we in agreement as to that? Um, it, it, well, it pains me to say, Your Honor, no, I, I actually do not agree. Okay. Um, now, do you understand uh, the term bias? Uh, what, how do you understand it? Uh, well, uh, lack of impartiality, um, uh, as you mentioned, closing of the mind to a certain position, uh, prejudice. Prejudice. Uh, will uh, your understanding of bias bring you to close yourself to any idea that uh, would uh, probably suggest you were not objective or you were not neutral? Or you would not tend more towards one side uh, rather than on to the other side? Your Honor, if, if I may uh, um, answer it first in this particular way, I have been writing in my column for almost 12 years. And uh, I have made particular private public positions on certain issues on civil liberties and what have you. Um, so therefore, I would have my biases as an advocate. But as a judge of the Supreme, as a justice of the Supreme Court, uh, my oath would be to uphold the Constitution, which is, I believe would be in text. And then later on, if the text is not clear, then I would try to discern whatever it is that the meaning of the people who drafted it uh, uh, wanted it to be. Okay, is bias a bad word? All of us, sir, have biases. That's why. Uh, okay. so, you are going to bring biases to the court if you were to be appointed? Well, my bias would be for the Philippines. My bias would be for the Constitution. That's a very ideal of you. But uh, will you agree with me if I said that the Constitution uh, somehow contains articles or provisions that uh, are replete with bias? Meaning requiring you to, to tend more towards one rather than the other uh, yes, sir. side of a litigation? Y yes, Your Honor. There have been uh, statements of principles, for example, on social justice, uh, particularly also provisions with regard to poverty, uh, with regard to the family, on women, um, indigenous peoples, and the like. Um, there have been occasions when the Supreme Court said that, well, uh, uh, like, for example, in the case of, of the prioritization of the budget for education. So you would, you would agree now that uh, bias is part of the judicial task? In the sense that the, to, to, to demonstrate bias in favor of what the Constitution... So um, you may not be a fair judge because you now agree to an extent that you could be biased. No, Your Honor, I am a fair judge because my duty as a judge exactly requires me to uphold what the Constitution says. And what the Constitution says is you should be biased according to you when it comes to due process, when it comes to health, when it comes to so many other things, family, etc. Um, depending, uh, depending on the exact provision, there are some provisions there that mention health so uh, as a... If, if that is your answer, you could be biased one time and not biased the other time. Is that always what you will be when you will be a justice of the Supreme Court? It's dangerous if you do not clarify that today and you get the appointment and suddenly you sit beside us in the court. Hmm? But, 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 Your Honor, there are certain provisions there that we know are not um, exactly executory but are merely exhortory. And there are some provisions there that we know should be upheld, like freedom, rights. Okay. okay. You have a situation here, an appeal of an accused who claims he has been uh, unjustly uh, convicted, prosecuted, and tried. And yet, uh, here comes the accused who says uh, he's innocent. Are you not going to be biased in his favor? 
because the Constitution says he should be presumed innocent. And that is a mandate of the Bill of Rights. Why are you thinking? You should have a ready answer for that because when you are a judge, you should be already uh, alert quickly because you have read the Constitution. Eh? You have uh, imbibed uh, a lot of jurisprudence. You have uh, understood, as you have just said right now, that due process is a, a source of bias for you. Are you not ready to answer me now if you could be biased as a justice of the Supreme Court? The, the, the presumption you should be biased. <laughs> Uh, the bias would be no, that's a, a problem that uh, often confronts us. You know, bias is not necessarily a bad word. People who misunderstood it and misunderstand it have made it a bad word. Mm -hmm. You know, we are dictated by no less than the Constitution to be biased. And that should not uh, disorient you or confuse you at all. Are you ready to be confused? Uh, I think before, but now I'm not. But <laughs> <laughs> no, but but to answer your question, Your Honor, uh, I, I took some time because obviously the, the, the bias would be the presumption of the innocence of the accused. But we are in the Supreme Court, so also the consideration is that there okay. have been lower courts. Let me let me give you this uh, concept that I have in mind. That's why I am very curious about the thinking of uh, people who contend for positions in the Supreme Court. Uh, there are many complicated cases, complex cases that go up to the court. Almost all, uh, almost all the liberations uh, are, uh, deal with complicated issues. Is it possible for you to resolve or navigate your your uh, uh, self, your mind, your thinking, if you did not have bias? Or, or, or um, well, actually, I, I agree, with Your Honor. I, I actually call it compass. Uh, either a professional or moral no, compass. No, I'm not talking about compass. The compass that we know is that one that points to the north all the time, okay? The geographical north. But what I am uh, talking about here is, here is a complex case. It uh, brings so many questions for consideration, for deliberation. If you do not know where to start, it is not easy for you to navigate your way through the complex issues. Somehow you must start with bias so that you will know where to start. At least resolve that particular starting point. That's my uh, concept. So anyone who tells me you are a biased judge, I am. Because I cannot resolve any complex case without bias. You get my drift? Yeah, yes, Your Honor. Actually, All right. I'm, I'm, it, Let's go to the other concept. What do you understand by judicial restraint? That, is that the opposite of judicial activism? In a sense, Your Honor, yes, because the, 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 the judiciary um, should not be uh, exercising its power to the extent that it will be substituting its discretion or judgment, uh, meaning policy, in the areas of policy, with regard to uh, the other branches of government. Um, one of the things that I have been pointing out to the public, and I have written up before about this, is that uh, people look at the qualifications of the Congress and they see how, how small or limited the qualifications that are required. Whereas with regard to the Supreme Court, what's required is that there be years of practice in law and, and, and the like. People think that, that because of that, that it tends to make the Supreme Court a more intelligent branch than the other two branches. And I've been pointing out that's not necessarily the case. Because the reason why the, 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 the qualifications for the Supreme Court includes uh, the legal uh, degree it's precisely because our function is essentially limited to looking at legal questions rather than political. Whereas the other two branches of government, the, 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 the requirements are, high, are, are highly or utterly minimal because it allows the people to be able to fill in as much variety as they can so that in terms of policy making, most, um, most, a most varied and different, uh, different thing in views can be made either in the legislation or in the implementation of the legislation. Okay, when it comes to uh, the issue of constitutionality of a law passed by Congress, there are two houses of Congress. We presume we give a high, the highest presumption of validity to this law because this was deliberated upon, discussed uh, by the two houses of Congress where uh, we have 
the elected representatives of the people uh, sit. Their collective wisdom passed that law. Uh, what do you think is required if you, that issue is raised at all? A serious issue about the constitutionality of that law. Uh, will you exercise judicial restraint or judicial activism? Um, definitely restraint. Um, precisely because the, the, the unequal branch of government had put a lot of time and effort into um, coming up with this kind of legislation. Unless there's a real um, clear violation of the Constitution, that, uh, I would prefer that the, the Supreme Court uh, exercises restraint. Um, but, um, so we will just dismiss immediately the petition that would challenge because you would be thereby exercising judicial restraint. No, not immediately. I mean, uh, that's a dangerous uh, stance that you tell me now. Um, not immediately, but you were mentioning bias uh, earlier. Your that's, and my bias is essentially with regard to judicial restraint. So. Your bias in favor of judicial restraint. <laughs> yes, sir. Oh, here is a question. You just told me that uh, you would rather have that law maintained or upheld. Uh, you were very quick in yes, your answer. Yes, uh, uh, does that justify your immediate dismissal of that petition that would challenge that law? No, my, my answer was just quick, but um, in real life what I would do is again study the, the case and give it the necessary time uh, and deliberation. But so under what circumstances would you nullify a law passed by the Congress um, whose collective wisdom is elective? Uh, number one would be is the one that clearly violates the text of the law. Number two, if that there is a clear non-showing of a public use or a uh, or reasonable means with regard to the to the objective that the Congress wants to achieve, um, uh, uh, save that. Uh, I would prefer to give this uh, deference to the to the wisdom of Congress. Having said that, Your Honor, I do realize. Well, you have heard of this. I'm not condemning them. I'm just. Parroting what uh, I read often, uh, many members of Congress are uh, scalawags, crooks. How do you trust their wisdom? I'm not uh, saying that I believe that statement, but uh, you also probably have read that statement. Will you now trust their wisdom? Will you now give them the presumption of validity as far as their uh, collective wisdom is concerned? And uh, you exercise now judicial restraint as far as their act is concerned? Well, is that what you mean? Um, I do not trust the Skalawags, but I do trust, I do trust the collective wisdom because I think in the experience that we had in, Philipp in, in, in our country, it is highly rare for a law to come out um, utterly unwise or utterly um, malicious in content. N now, assuming that there could be some that could have some flaws constitutionally, that is why the Supreme Court is there to uh, conduct the checks and balance necessary on Congress precisely because they, they, would, they are human. They're going to commit mistakes in, in one form or another. The Supreme Court could also con uh, make mistakes. That's why ultimately for me the, the Supreme checks and balance is the people themselves. That ultimately, by the act of suffrage or by by a referendum, um, people could actually have a, serve a check on government. I, I think again, if I may mention a name, um, the, the Federalist Papers, James Madison, was very clear and very eloquent in writing about the better nature of of, of men. Or, um, but if men were angels, then no government is necessary. Madison was over 400 years ago, or 200. Uh, Jesus is 2,000 years ago. Oh, uh, but that, we are not talking about religion here. <laughs> We are talking about law, about justice, uh, about membership in the Supreme Court, where we will be contending with these issues. That's the point that I am making. I do not like uh, to pass you, um, uh, that you pass master, unless I can see that uh, you are capable of uh, uh, fairness in the adjudicative process that we have in the Supreme Court. And many people are often asking, uh, are you a justice who is going to be uh, uh, influenced by judicial activism or a justice who will follow judicial restraint? Uh, these people who are asking are often people who do not understand the work that we uh, have to put in. 
So that is why I wanted to know from you if you had the same understanding of these terms as I do. Uh, now, judicial intervention in policy making that is where you would need to discuss judicial restraint. Is that uh, agreed? Yes, yes, sir. On that? yes, sir. Now, the power of the Supreme Court of Judicial Review, as well as under the second paragraph of Section 1 of Article 8 of the Constitution, uh, necessarily requires you to intervene in policy. So, uh, if you were to answer my question now, are you one for judicial restraint all the time? Um, restraint in, a, in, in, a, in a relative terms, Your Honor. Um, I, I, I was no, when you exercise power, the, the power of judicial review and the power, the uh, uh, grave abuse uh, clause. One, one um, complexity that this Constitution gives, gives everyone is the power of the Supreme Court to look on the nature of grave abuse of discretion, which necessarily would include policy, areas of policy or areas that normally would be considered as a political question. Um, my doctorate, the, the, my dissertation paper actually examined the limits of constitutional of the judicial power with regard to this area of grave abuse of discretion. Have you, have you published that dissertation? Uh, Why don't you give us a copy? Is I, that, I did, I did, uh, you, you gave us a copy? Uh -huh. All right. Uh, you are a doctor of laws, huh? uh -huh. doctor, doctor, can you treat uh, head eight? <laughs> yes. Okay. Put my handwriting. <laughs> no. Uh, okay. Uh, I think you are clear enough that you would rather be a judicial, uh, judicially restrained jurist, no? Okay. But remember what I just uh, told you about bias. Do not condemn that term, because bias is often misunderstood, and it is misunderstood because. Oh, philosophers have given it a bad name. Judges sometimes and very frequently need to be biased in order to resolve complex issues. And anyway, the Constitution, just a parting uh, comment on this, the Constitution itself dictates that you have to be biased. Do you agree with me? Um, yes, yeah, sure. Yeah. If, the if, if the I Constitution mean. says innocence is uh, presumed. Is that not dictating bias in favor of one party? Yes, sir. In, in okay. fact, the Constitution says favor labor. Is that not an expression of bias? Yes, sir. Favor the environment. Is that not? So we are clear about where you stand. Yes, sir. Uh, um, actually, one of the things that I have been pondering about is with regard to the area of discrimination. The Constitution does not. Um, actually frown upon discrimination, it frowns upon unlawful discrimination. And, it, and the Constitution, I do agree uh, with us, if I may say, the Constitution does a lot of discrimination as well, positive discrimination in favor of Filipinos, in favor of the young, in favor of the poor. I don't call that discrimination. It's bias in favor of uh, patrioti uh, patriotism, nationalism, etc. Uh, okay, Dr. Gadula, I have nothing more to ask you. Uh, I'll give the floor now to my colleagues here and thank you uh, for uh, uh, giving frank answers. I hope if you were appointed uh, you would be biased. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, sir. May I note the uh, interpolation to Justice Tiham and may I be allowed to leave Good morning, Dean uh, Gadula. 
We gave you a, a written exams yesterday, and it was on the topic of same-sex marriage. And we completely forgot that you were one of the lead counsel in the Falsi's case. So what is your, for the record, what, is, what again is your stand on same-sex marriage? Um. Detached from the Falsi's case, uh, my stand on same-sex marriage, personally, not as a justice, but uh, not, uh, personally, I feel that it's not a, a, a valid definition of marriage. It is not contributory to the common good. Uh, I believe that marriage is not created by the state, but rather has been recognized by the state. And, uh, and that marriage is between a man and a woman in comprehensive union, which same-sex marriage is not. Is that more of a moral conviction or moral judgment on your part? Um, no, um, partly, but also because of the fact that history, sociologically uh, and philosophically, marriage has always been, in, in a way, defined that way. Um, and uh, even though, for example, uh, the church may have a certain, st the Catholic Church may have a certain stand on same-sex marriage. I have never actually relied on the teachings of the Catholic Church to, to defend my position on whether or not uh, it would be better for the Philippines to stick to the traditional definition of marriage. Now, as a judge, as a magistrate, as a justice of the Supreme Court, in deciding cases, should you be influenced by your moral convictions, your moral judgments? Um, Assuming that the provision that we're talking about leaves a certain room for interpretation or latitude for the judge, the, there's always a possibility that perhaps the, the, the judge may be called upon to make a judgment. Because there would be certain areas, like for example, um, if we're talking about for, uh, on issues of incest, on, in, on issues, for example, of, of uh, pornography, or, 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 or issues of uh, Bestiality. There is always a moral component on those on those things. But if we're talking here of the uh, an express, clear text of the law, I think uh, I would have to set aside whatever my moral convictions are and apply the law uh, as it is written. Now, with respect to the issue of same-sex marriage, is there a, a constitutional or legal basis for striking it down or upholding it? Sorry, same, uh, striking down same-sex marriage, huh? Yes. Um, the difference with the U.S. Constitution is that the Philippine Constitution contains several, several mentions of the word marriage, family, and uh, children. And, um, and as I also pointed out with regard to the oral arguments on, on June 26, la last year, uh, when we look at the dictionary and the, any survey perhaps at that time, from the time that the civil code was made, and then also with regard to the family code and the 1987 constitution, the belief of most people is that marriage has always been between a man and a woman. It is within that short time from 1987 to now that people have been open to the idea of marriage as between two people. Um, but uh, my position has always been that we interpret the constitution, and I think that has been the, 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 the belief of the Supreme Court in Francisco and I think in civil liberties. We interpreted the Constitution as, as it was meant or understood by the people at the time that they ratified it. And so I believe in 1987, people thought that marriage is between a man and a woman, and I think we, we will have to uh, uh, hopefully abide by that. Um, secondarily, the transcript of the Code Constitutional Commission also makes uh, mention of certain discussions on marriage, and the implication is that it was always understood as, between, as being between a man and a woman. No. Okay. Earlier, the Chief Justice made mention of certain biases enshrined in the Constitution, like protection in favor of women. Is that a reasonable bias? Do, are, are women, do they belong to the minority? Women constitute more than half, probably, of the population of the world. Um, I've actually Are women, do women belong to the weaker sex? Oh, no. I think women will, will uh, contest that uh, assertion. So is that, is, that, is that a bias? Is that an unreasonable bias? Why the Constitution should expressly state protection, a classification for women? Um, I've actually pondered upon, upon that issue on why uh, women have been given certain mentions constitutionally. 
but the period we're talking about here is, is sometime 1987 when I think um, professionally and politically women have not achieved the same levels as they have right now. The Philippines right now is I think among the top five of giving women uh, great responsibility politically and in business. But I think at the time that it was made in 1987, that certainly was not the case. There has been uh, an amount of uh, probably misogyny and um, sexism uh, directed towards women. And I, I think a lot of it is coming right out right now with the Me Too movement in the U.S. So uh, I, I, I actually agree with, with, with what you mentioned about the fact that they constitute 50% of the population. And hence, it makes us wonder why they're part of the minority. But perhaps also because of the fact that they are 50%, and then the behavior that has been exhibited upon them in the past. Um, I, I remember, for example, in the 1950s, if you get to be a secretary, if a woman becomes a secretary, a mere secretary in a corporation, um, that is already considered a big achievement. Um, so there is perhaps a, a, a reason for that. Um, but for now, uh, at this present time, if we're talking of policy, I think it's something that needs to be revisited. In case of ambiguity in the provision of the Constitution, and you are in the Supreme Court, you are tasked to interpret the Constitution. In case of ambiguity, is it necessary for you to refer to the journals of the Constitutional Commission? My, my position, sir, uh, is that, oh, Your Honor, is that, uh, again, and also looking at the past cases that the Supreme Court has made mention of this, Francisco, and I think the other one is Civil Liberties Union, the first instinct would not be to go to the journals of the Constitutional Commission, but rather to go to the uh, what would be the normal understanding of the people directly at that time when they were looking at the Constitution? So you would, you would give more credence to what you perceive to be the understanding of the electorate who approve it rather than the framers of the Constitution? Uh, uh, the fr for the framers, probably as a support or, or subsidiary to that. And the, the reason being is that technically the, the author of the Constitution is not the Constitutional Commission, but rather the people themselves. So I think when they ratified it, they understood it in a certain way. And so I, I think that that should be the one that's given deference. Now let's talk about current events. Congress. There is a fight for speakership position in Congress. And there's talk about term sharing. Is that legally permissible? Is it constitutional to agree to term sharing? I mean, members of Congress they serve for a period of three years. Now, under the terms sharing scheme, if there are three, three uh, aspirants, they would be sharing one year term. Is that legally permissible and constitutional? Um, I think these, the Constitution does not expressly mention a specific term. We're talking about the Speaker, Your Honor? Yes, only um, speakership. Uh, I think there's... Uh, I think there is no... Supposing Congressman Cayetano, Congressman Velasco, Congressman Gonzalez, and Congressman Romualdez agree to a term sharing, and they put that in writing, is that legally enforceable? Is that legally permissible? Is that constitutional? Oh, um, several questions. If, is it constitutional? My likely answer, of course, as, as usual, if you were in the Supreme Court, there will be greater deliberation on this. But right now, my likely answer would be, is it constitutional? The answer is yes. Because I don't think there's a prohibition of the Constitution that makes that requires a speaker to be there for the entire three years. Now, whether that is a wise thing to do, I leave to the electorate. Because if, the, if, the, if it turns out that to, to divide the speakership terms into three makes, these, makes the House of Representatives uh, paralyzed and unable to do its duties, and I think the electorate will give a backlash on that one. The other question you ask is: it, Is it legally enforceable? Uh, I will have doubts on that one because that would that entails a certain public position, and I think the position of the Supreme Court is that, with regard to uh, as a matter of contract, I don't think you can make uh, uh, a position uh, the subject of a contract. A written agreement among the aspirants, sealed, signed, sealed, and delivered, will that be considered binding upon Congress? No, I, my answer there would be no, Your Honor. That would still require the approval of the majority of Congress. Yes, Your right? Honor. All right. All right. Let's, let's talk about protected speech. If media prints a statement calling the president a coward 
for not standing up against China or calling the president a mass murderer for the campaign against illegal drugs, are those statements considered protected speech? Um, for the former, I would probably answer in the affirmative. Um, I think we should be giving leeway to media uh, in, in uh, making its points in the way that it should be uh, more accessible to the public. And I think the Supreme Court has always ruled that public officials should not have a thin skin and should be able to accept the criticism of what have you. Um, the problem, my problem with the second question is that it makes mention of the word murder. And that's, for me, it's a, a technical term. And uh, unless there is clear evidence and that would uh, back up, um, that dangerously falls into the realm of, li uh, of, of being libelous. In the reverse, supposing it's the president who calls media the purveyor of fake news, or he tells drug dealers deserve to die, is that covered by protected speech? Um, as as I'm trying to find the correct word here, as uh, interesting as those comments may be, I don't think uh, I think they would still fall under uh, the the purview of protected speech, Your Honor. Um, uh, uh, fake news, for example, is not a technical term. Uh, the other things that he's saying is essentially a feeling or emotion that this is something that should happen. Um, it would be, I think, better left to the people, um, either by way of the midterm elections or electing his successor, to be able to uh, show their approval on this one. Um, it is possible that uh, speech could be done in such a way, uh, particularly if it involves a highly technical or legal meaning, that it could result in um, a violation of, of uh, the Constitution, perhaps, free, uh, and which would entail perhaps uh, an impeachable offense. But that's highly unlikely, Your Honor. You're in the academe yes. as well. Harvard rescinded the admission of a student due to a racist slur or remark. If that same thing happens in the Philippines, Will the act of the school be considered valid and legal? Uh, and if that constitutional issue is raised before the Supreme Court, how would you decide it? Um, the, 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 the complications in that case, and you're talking of okay, Kyle, Kyle Kashuv, is that, and I don't agree with it, because of the fact that I think a 16-year-old should be allowed to be stupid, and, 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 uh, and a person could grow, and a person could mature. But having said that, Harvard, being a private institution, um, would have the ability to make its own decisions on who to accept. So as objectionable as that decision may seem to me, um, I think Harvard is well within its rights and academic freedom to do so. But um, here in the Philippines, uh, the same thing under the Philippine setting. Um, were, it, were it a private university, um, I would probably have to uh, think of it in the same way. Um, the, the complications would arise if it were a public university. Uh, and in our particular case also as well, uh, perhaps what may adjust my answer uh, with regard to the private university, the one I mentioned earlier, is the fact that racism is not such a hot topic or controversial topic here in the Philippines. Um, one invokes racism here and you will not see burning cars or riots in the streets. One of the reasons why I think they are a little bit careful in the U.S. is because even a hint of racism could result in broken windows and, and, uh, and even serious injury to a lot of people. What is the rate of habeas data? What is your understanding of the rate um, of habeas data? I, I've heard about it before, Your Honor, but uh, I'm not uh, sorry. If a politician is implicated by the president, in alleged illegal drug activities, and his name is included in his so-called narco list, and he applies for a writ of habeas data, do you think that relief should be granted by the court? I'm sorry, who's applying, sir, for the habeas data? The politician whose name was 
implicated by the press yeah. in, into alleged illegal drug activities. And he is included in the so-called narco list. Can he seek relief by applying for a writ of habeas data? Um, I would probably have to say uh, yes, Your Honor, on that one. Uh, particularly also to to be able to enforce his right to uh, the right to be able to defend himself and also his presumption of innocence. Now, one last question. The IAAF, International Association of Athletic Federation, disqualified an Olympic champion, Castor Semenya from South Africa, from participating in female competitions because she is biologically, according to the IAF, she is biologically male and she has to reduce her natural testosterone in order to compete as a female. They conducted this so-called gender verification test and they applied the hormone rule and they declared that she has more male hormones than female. It's a medical condition known as differences of sex development. People born with typical male XY chromosome pattern. Now, to be allowed to compete, the IAAF required that the affected athletes be required to medically reduce their testosterone level to below a specific threshold. Is that legally permissible? Would that be constitutional if under the Philippine setting? Uh, I a, a, an Olympic champion, a female, yes. but based on their gender identification test, it was revealed that she has more, she is biologically male, and therefore before she, she's allowed to compete in the female competition, she has to undergo certain requirements. Your question is whether, uh, is, it, is it correct that she's not allowed to compete? Or? Yes, uh, also that. Uh, and then imposing certain requirements before she is allowed to compete. Um, I, I think with regard to the Philippine setting, uh, we've, we've had uh, the, the, I forgot the term, the inviolability of the gender uh, or the immutability of the gender of the, of the person. So if a person is born female, then that person is female and will be considered as such. So should, be, uh, should she be allowed to compete? The answer is yes. I think the rationale given by the IAAF, because there is some due advantage on the part of somebody who has more male testosterone mm -hmm. in her body. I think that's the point. Um, but I think in the Philippine setting we have not, with regard to the second question, I think with regard to the Philippine setting we have not had such guidelines that would allow us to make a call on that one. And certainly to force her to do so, I think would be against her uh, due process rights of, of life and liberty. Uh, uh, one last question. Uh, Is mandatory ROTC Constitution? Um, well, I have written about it and I have been pushing for mandatory ROTC. Um, but in, in, in direct answer to your question, the answer I think is yes. I think the state has the right to call upon the service of the youth. And there are also provisions in education wherein the youth are supposed to be fostered uh, patriotism and uh, also with regard to their overall well being. So, in, in the sense that there's no to the rest of your recollection and uh, research. Why was it discontinued in the past? Um, there have been, there was a ruling before the, uh, of the Supreme Court which actually uh, raised, which actually granted constitutionality to the um, ROTC. It was discontinued in the past because of certain people who I think uh, unfortunately got injured or had a, an unfortunate um, occurrence happen to them while undergoing the ROTC program. But I think uh, overall, uh, if that is the, then that would, I think the, the rationale for, for discontinuing it is a fallacy. If that would be uh, the rationale, then the answer would be to ensure safeguards so for such unfortunate events to not happen again. But overall, the constitutionality of the thing, um, assuming that Congress thinks it's a wise thing to do in their discretion, um, I, I think uh, such a law should be upheld. All right. Thank you, Dean, and good luck. Thank you. Thank you, sir.
Thank you very much, uh, Justice Deep. Uh, thank you, uh, Justice Mendoza, Chairperson of this Council. Yes, uh, good morning, Dean. Um, uh, thank you. Um, I'm actually not a dean. Uh, I am not a dean. Uh, I'm, oh. uh, I'm a secretary at the School of Governance. <laughs> but should they address you as a dean? Uh, uh, you're a faculty secretary operations committee, uh -huh. School of Law and Governance, University of Asia and Pacific. And your credentials are too impressive, being an author of a book or books. But yet, I've seen that your application letter has grammatical error. Can I read? And I quote, I am presently with the University of Asia and the Pacific School of Law and Governance as Operations Committee Secretary Lecturer. That is your application letter. And which followed, attached is a copy of my full CV, my updated personal data sheet, and other requirements. Is this correct? Attach is with so many documents, or rather, what? Is this the way your uh, decisions and resolutions uh, may be drafted and released if and when you are nominated and appointed as an associate justice of the Supreme Court. Because we in the council, in our pursuit to improve the judiciary, we refuse to shortlist those who do not know these basic matters. And why should you be an exception? Um. Well, I, I may have to agree on that. What I was doing, Your Honor, was that I was following the format uh, of the applications letters that were presented in the, in the uh, online, and I didn't want to deviate too much from it. Um, this is, the fir this is uh, for, for me quite an important matter. So what I wanted to do was to essentially just try to uh, be as conforming to what has been written on the online application form and not deviate too much. Um, that is unfortunate, Your Honor, I will admit. But I think I have 12 years of writing uh, my, my, my column in Business World as well as all the papers that I've written before. And, um, and I think you could probably, if I, if I may invite you to, to look at that writing, and if that writing is still does not pass muster, um, then perhaps I should not be in the court. But uh, I do uh, plead that not I mean, just for that one mistake, if ever it, it is a mistake, uh, be taken against me. Uh, thank you. But, uh, not being simply apologetic, but yet uh, not subservient. Right, why did you move from San Beda to Aureliano? Considering that you graduated with honors in all schools, and the records show that uh, you've been in San Beda from what year? 19... That is in the College of Law. And, uh, and again, and why did you transfer to Aureliano? Um, simply put, I had a bad year. I mean, I had an off year. Uh, I, I, I missed the... Uh, QPI? QPI? Uh, yes, by 0.1%. Mm, coming from what? Uh, who was then your professor? Actually, that's the thing. I had no failing grades in all the years I have been studying. It's just that when they averaged it, I missed it by 0.1%. Mm. Well, let's look into your medical records. That, uh, May 6, 2019, 14, trace, and blood came, FBS, cholesterol, high. And uh, we're looking into the best and the most fitted physically and mentally applicant. And your medical certificate states that physically and mentally stable at the time of examination. How about subsequent findings? Do you consider yourself physically and mentally stable? Uh, um, yes. Uh, I have not, I'm not taking any uh, maintenance medicines. Uh, I have been keeping up a physical routine uh, almost regularly. 
Um, I have no restrictions on diet, uh, fortunately, so far. So uh, I would guess, I would say uh, I'm, I'm in pretty good shape, thankfully. Instead, so. what is your weight now? No. Uh, 75. 75. Uh, a little bit, uh, sorry, a little bit overweight. <laughs> <laughs> a little bit being defined as. <laughs> so it's not ideal, so apparently. <laughs> but I'm working on it, Your Honor. Uh, what? Uh, to diet, exercise? Uh, diet, exercise, I swim a lot. And uh, my, my wife is a great cook and supportive of me, so we're mm -hmm. hoping to... Your wife, uh, a government retiree, you stated uh, in yeah. your PDS? Uh, yes, uh, she used to be with the uh, soldier and the DVP, and now she's teaching and has a business. You attended the study of U.S. Institute's program in 2016. And, uh, what did you learn there from that you could use in the Supreme Court if and when you are appointed? Um, well, they gave us a, 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 a rather deep appreciation of the background and fundamentals of the U.S. Constitution. And the more interesting thing there is that I was coming in as perhaps one of, the o one of only two or three lawyers. And the rest of the class were all political theorists and political philosophers. So I was able to get an, uh, a deeper appreciation for what the Tocqueville, for example, was saying, Madison, uh, Jefferson, and all the others. Um, and so uh, that, that for me was, a, was a, uh, a very useful experience, particularly in viewing the Constitution now. Um, our Constitution history, of course, is very much uh, uh, related to the U.S. Constitution. But I, I would also add, actually, that the, the, the program very generously gave me a set of funds to buy a, on a huge amount of books, and I think that also uh, is the, the more helpful one. Right, uh, your your uh, expertise is uh, similarly on the international economic law and policy. Am I correct? Um, yes, that's what, uh, well. Uh, if I if I may, Your Honor, I started out having a specialization on international economic law and policy, but a lot of my recent work. Well, we do know right now that international trade is not one of the things that used to be in the headlines. Um, so WTO used to be the headlines from '95 to 2001, but right now there, it has been relegated back to the business pages. A lot of my work right now focuses on constitutional issues, particularly with regard to sex, uh, whether that be on same-sex marriage, the RH law, contracept, uh, and abortion, and also with regard to euthanasia. And uh, again, uh, if and when you're appointed in the Supreme Court, uh, you could be assigned cases involving complex issues in different fields of the law. How do you intend to resolve those cases outside of your expertise? I have been, I think, um, reasonably working on a prize um, to a, a very competent degree with, on the other areas of the Constitution. Um, I, I, I may be focusing my teaching on uh, international law, but I have been teaching as well and working as well on other areas of the Constitution. So, uh, and that is actually the reason why I'm applying for, for the Supreme Court. Um, hopefully to contribute whatever it is that I may have um, gathered along the way with regard to the Constitution. In your Facebook page, you openly post comments against the LGBT's fight for reforms in the church, school, laws, and daily lives. In, in fact, uh, the questions and answers have been zeroed by Justice Tiham on this issues, but you did not include Q at LGBT without a Q. Do you know what is Q stand for? Queer. Okay. And the reason why I did not is because I have to stop somewhere. Uh, otherwise, the, the, the alphabet will be LGBT, T, Q, R, S, W, it will be too long. <laughs> And so I, I just made a decision editorially to stop at LGBT. So in being an active in the Facebook about various issues, since you seem to speak on your mind at all times, is this not uh, dangerous? Uh, are you seemingly be good, good fit in the judiciary if and when you're appointed? Uh, yeah, actually that's why I, was, uh, I found it interesting that Chief Justice Bersamin was... Uh, uh, <laughs> Telling me about being having an independent mind because nobody has not accused me of that so far. But uh, 
but I'm working as a as an advocate for those public issues. Um, so I think the question is, can I be a fair and impartial um, judge, assuming that uh, I, I do get to be part of the of the of the Supreme Court? And I would be very, with high conviction, say the answer is yes. I could detach whatever religious or philosophical beliefs I have uh, from from what I feel and what I'm, from what I have learned uh, is what the Constitution provides. So I, I will have no hesitation in upholding the Constitution um, if if that is what is being expressly provided for uh, in, uh, in 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 that provision of law. All right. Uh, we have here copies of your ideas from. Uh, 2015 to 2017, and your gross compensation in all three years seems to be stable in the modest side, which does not seem commensurate with your network. Mm. Could you kindly explain this to this council? Um, what happened there, Your Honor, is that uh, we're talking here, I think, of the three years, right? But before that, we, I had a mortgage with the bank. I, I, I don't want to name it here, if, if it's okay with you, or if you, if you want me to. Yeah, you have to disclose it. Okay, PS problem. Bank. Hmm. So, uh, and PS Bank had a program wherein after 10 years of paying for that particular mortgage on the property, what they will do is they will return the entire premium back to you. And so that's the reason for the, for the, for, for the amount of money that you see. And uh, there's likewise a discrepancy in your cash deposits of almost triple in your PDS declaration, 900,000, vis-a-vis your 2018 sal and 350,000. Again, please explain this discrepancy. My, my understanding with regard to the, nine, uh, to the response uh, for the 900,000 is that it included the investments. Uh, for the 300,000, my understanding was that it only meant the cash deposit. Uh, I, I may be wrong, but that's how I understood it, and that's why I did not include the investments in the, in the uh, salon. All right, to replying again, this is an associate justice of the Supreme Court. What are your expectations in the Supreme Court? Uh, it's, it's for me the um, the 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 body which I feel that if I join, uh, I will be able to provide uh, the the service that I feel that I could give the best for for the country. Um, I I do believe that I am coming in, uh, hopefully at the right time, wherein we are faced with such crucial issues, not only politically but also socially, and I feel that my training hopefully could contribute to that. Um, the fact that I'm not from the judiciary, I hope, provides uh, a, 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 a variation of views or a, a, a different set of views that could hopefully provide balance and a further balance to the court. And, um, and I hope to uh, be able to contribute as well in making the court um, uh, have greater respect uh, and essentially inculcated the people a greater respect also for the rule of law. And uh, what do you consider your most significant career accomplishment to date as a lawyer, a private practitioner, and member of the academy? Well, uh, one, well, definitely arguing for the Supreme Court is one of the things that I have been dreaming of since I was young. And so um, appearing before an oral argument was a, was a big deal for me. The other one is uh, getting my doctorate. Um, as one ages, uh, one gets to feel a limitation of powers. When I got my LLM from Cambridge, I did so purely on my own sheer um, abilities. But getting the doctorate required the help from a lot of friends, and knowing that I got help from those friends um, essentially was special to me. And so I would also consider that doctorate. Cambridge? Yeah, uh, Cambridge was for my LLM, my, my Cambridge master's. Cambridge where? Uh, England. Ah, England. Uh, that's uh, Cambridge in Cubao, so, you know. <laughs> <laughs> even uh, in Providence Village. So, uh, anyway, and uh, what is your most failure in life? I, I'll probably quote Sinatra. Um, there may be some, but I, too few to mention. In the end, I think I have been fortunate enough that whatever I did not get, um, 
Providence has provided me something better. If you could start your career over again, what would you do differently? I'd probably apply as a Formula One driver. <laughs> I'm just joking. But no, I don't think I'll change anything. I think I've been pretty much blessed in the way uh, it, has been, it has progressed. It's not, I wouldn't say it's normal actually. Um, some of the things I did are not some of the things that other lawyers my age or the lawyers before me have done. I have pretty much carved out my own, per, my own career path. And I think I have pretty much carved out my own kind of law practice. Uh, and so I, th um, I would have to say I'm just grateful for what happened. Uh, and in that gratitude, I would say I would not change anything. And why leave that stature? Sorry? And why leave that stature? It's more greener in the other fields than in the judiciary. Um, simply because I, I feel it's a duty that if I have the ability to be able to give more to my country, I will. Uh, it may sound idealistic, it may sound corny, but that's purely the reason I have. Wow, corny, admittedly. <laughs> and what have you done professionally that is not, that is an experience you wouldn't want to repeat? I think um, uh, there have been some unfortunate things that happened, but I think they all contributed to me be over, being a better person. So I really cannot, I mean, I, I'm not trying to dodge the question, but I really cannot think of something right now that, uh, that I feel is so traumatic or so bad that, uh, that I would not be willing to repeat it. I, I think whatever bad thing happened to me is something that contributed to me also maturing as a person. If and when you're appointed as an Associate Justice of the Supreme Court, what specific reforms will you undertake to make a substantial contribution not only to the benefit of the bench, bar, but to the private sector? Um, right now I'm speaking as an outsider. Um, def definitely there are, uh, there's a need uh, for, for uh, speedier trials. There's a need to hire more lawyers particularly for uh, the prosecution branch. There's a need also with regard to better legal education. Um, but I would limit my answer to saying this, that if there's one thing I would like to contribute to the court, and that would be to have a consistent uh, judicial uh, theme and philosophy with regard to the rulings, um, and so that uh, the, the bench and bar would be, uh, in a way, see the predictability in which the court would go with regard to the, to the Constitution and, and their rights. Um, I, and I say this with all due respect because I also say this as a law student. Um, there have been often times that there are too many exceptions to the general rule that the Supreme Court has been giving. And, uh, and I do also know the complexity with which the Supreme Court approaches or is faced with. But if there is one thing I would like to strive is to be able to attain that consistency in, in judicial approach. And uh, who would you mention to be your role model um, in the judiciary? Well, uh, in terms of, well, the, the three of you. <laughs> so, uh, but uh, Justice Natura has always been uh, my, one of my uh, uh, heroes with regard to the Constitution. Um, Isagani Cruz also because of, of writing. Um, but if I may mention Ian Brownlee, uh, who is an ad hoc judge of the International Court of Justice, and also Antonin Scalia of the uh, U.S. Supreme Court. All right, thank you. That was my last and final question. Good luck and uh, to your journey. Thank you, Your Honor. Thank you very much, uh, Judge Ilaw. Good noon. Yes. Uh, uh, how? How can how, how do we call you? Not Dean. Uh, 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 actually, Your Honor, Jeremy is fine. Jeremy. Yeah. But you wanted to be called Justice earlier. Oh, <laughs> okay. oh, what is your judicial philosophy? If I may ask. You answered that earlier, but I would just want to be clarified. Um, really, just to be able to uphold whatever it is that the Constitution provides, uh, to be able to set aside one's personal feelings and beliefs. And um, ultimately, just to uphold what the, uh, what the people uh, believe or feel that is best for them. What did you mean, uh, set aside your feelings or beliefs? 
Um, all of us have our backgrounds, philosophies, by uh, uh, prejudices, um, our religious beliefs, and, and the like. But ultimately, as a judge, it, uh, it boils down to what it is that the Constitution provides. And so, uh, even though, for example, my religion may say certain things, but uh, I would have to defer to whatever it is that the Constitution may say. And, uh, and uh, that's it, Your Honor. You mentioned biases earlier. Uh, can you explain, expand on that further? Um, well, we're talking here about a certain um, a, a, a slant towards a certain viewpoint. So the Constitution has a certain slant, for example, with regard to women, indigenous uh, peoples, um, also with regard to human rights, also social justice, um, and that that would be the bias I think that Chief Justice Bersemin and I were talking about. Should you be appointed to the Supreme Court, will you bring those biases with you? The, as, as I mentioned earlier, how, um, the bias that I would seek to uphold is whatever it is contained in the Constitution. Um, I would strive, and I, and I think I have been pondering enough, uh, even before I sit before you, on what would be my own biases that I would be uh, dutifully setting aside, assuming I get to be a member of the Court. So you're prepared to set them aside? My own personal... Yes. Uh -huh. So you, sh you would be neutral or uh, objective? Yes, Your Honor. You earlier mentioned that uh, you studied the RH law. When does life begin? As far as your concern? A conception, Your Honor. Sure. In the United States, there were several uh, states which adopted the law prohibiting abortion if there is already a heartbeat. In the context of the Philippine Constitution, what can you say about that? Um, fine, Your Honor, but. Uh, our, our concept of when life begins uh, starts way before even the, the, the heartbeat. The, uh, the moment that the, 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 the zygote uh, meets with the egg of the, of the female, you, all, uh, you immediately already have the, 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 that new life that begins. Uh, a new DNA, an independent, distinct DNA, an entity has been created inside the woman the moment that the sperm and the egg uh, has uh, come together. How do you determine that? Science has told without uh, the heartbeat. No, but science has told us that, Your Honor, because of the fact that there is already a distinction between the mother and the and the, the, the fetus that is there. So even if, for example, it's just a dot, that dot is already generating its own its own life and its own um, sustenance. It may be dependent on the mother, but it is distinct from the mother. So the DNA of that of that uh, dot, for example, would already be distinct from the DNA of the father and the mother. So we know that that, that particular point is already a new life that began. So the heartbeat is not a gauge? Um, it's actually a more liberal gauge because it starts a little bit, it starts far after uh, than, than our own conception of when life began. Uh, you are against gay marriage, I... Am I correct? Uh, personally, yes, Your Honor. Yes, yes. How about partnership? Um, and that's something I also wrote in the, in the test. The, the problem with civil unions or partnerships is that, uh, well, first of all, I don't think it's contributory to the common good. That's one. The second thing is that if you're going to create a civil union or civil partnership, then what's the basis for it? We know that for marriage, the basis is the comprehensive union of the man and woman. But for the civil union, what would be the basis? And normally the answer by the LGBT lobby or those who are advocating for civil unions or partnerships is on emotional bond. But if you're talking of emotional bond, then why should we limit a civil union or partnership with only two homosexual couples? Why should we not extend the civil union or partnership to all other human relationships that have an uh, emotional bond? So, for example, mere friendships between two individuals without, where it's no sex is happening, but because of the fact that they have a friendship, or between a mentor and a mentee, or between a father and a daughter, mothers, or between brothers and sisters, for purposes of being able to create certain property, 
uh, welfare and uh, adoption rights or what have you, why can't it be done to extend it to all those other uh, human relationships? That for me is the, is the flaw in the argumentation with regard to civil union and partnerships. You do not, uh, how do you consider them as, uh, uh, you, you mean to say uh, you want to uh, disregard their emotions? No, 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 Your Honor. What I'm saying is that because right now, I mean, um, people are free to be able to form relationships in, in the form that they want. They could actually have a contract to, that will protect their family right, their property rights. They could, they could essentially, the legal system, from the Bill of Rights to contract law to criminal law, essentially protects all in the, all citizens, whether it be heterosexual, homosexual. What they are asking for is a government recognition of their particular relationship. So my question in return is, but what's the basis for the uh, recognition by, by the government of their particular relationship? Because there is no... You mean to say you, they are already protected under our current laws? Most of the things that they're asking for are, are actually protected already under current laws. There may be some revisions needed perhaps for adoption, some revisions may be needed perhaps for uh, SSS, GSIS, uh, giving of benefits, but for a greater part of the rights, I think a lot of it is already covered by the Bill of Rights, the Civil Code, and the, and the, and the Criminal Law. Is it not better uh, if uh, these laws are codified? To protect them, because they are also human beings. But 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 your honor, they are codified already. Number one in the Bill of Rights, also in the Civil Code and in Criminal Law. Uh, we're talking here of, of, of a population that's probably between at, at generously that's a population of around five percent. Most statistics will probably show a population of one to two percent. And so, Should what, we not protect them? But they are already protected, your honor. That's what that's what I'm that's what I'm saying. The question is, why should additional why should the recognition and rights be additionally given to them over and above that has been given to other people? Now, the, the, what are those uh, benefits being given to them over and above the, what the ordinary human beings? They're, they're essentially asking for recognition with regard to employment just in case they do not, they do not get hired. They are asking for a, uh, um, uh, a setting aside or ignorance, for example, of free speech or even with regard to religious rights in terms of the employment, in terms of the academe, and, and what have you. It also presents your honor a problem of evidentiary um, means. Because scientifically, whether, when we're talking, for example, of homosexuality, we're talking here of something that's really within the, the subjective mind of a person. I mean, there's no blood that can be drawn, there's no skin or muscle tissue that can be taken to be able to indicate if a person is indeed claiming that is indeed a homosexual or not. So if, for example, you have a person that was turned away from a job application, there's no way for this person to prove that he is indeed a homosexual. We just have to take his word for it. And neither can the other person, the employer, be able to defend himself because there's no way for him to be able to tell if that person is indeed a homosexual or not. That's why in the US, for example, there are certain problems that comes up with regard to labor law because you have a person who claims to be a transgender uh, and uh, who is a woman trapped in a man's body and later on that uh, gentleman, that person would be found uh, flirting with the women in the ladies' bathroom. And then when he was approached by HR, why was he doing that? His reply was, yes, I'm a woman trapped in a man's body, but I'm also a lesbian. So, I mean, how is it possible for us to be able to construct a, a legal system to be able to account for something that even the scientific community is having a difficulty with. So your view is that it is only physical. How about the sexual inter yeah, orientation? But, but again, that's subjective, Your Honor. Again, there's nothing prohibiting them from having that relationship, Your Honor. It's not criminal. The question is, should that desire, orientation, or attraction be recognized by the government, by the state. So the question that next comes up is, why should the state give that recognition? We, we know it's given recognition to marriage because it produces future citizens. But with regard to, for example, homosexual couples, which again, I say, it's not illegal. They can actually do whatever it is that they want uh, with the privacy of, within the privacy of their own home or public if they, if they so want. But 
what they're asking for additionally is government recognition. That is why during the oral arguments, I was uh, pointing out that normally, a petition for certiorari would be for a petitioner to say that uh, the government has to prove com uh, state interest or any other standard on why the government should include into a person's rights. In this particular case, what the petitioner was asking is, uh, is, is that the government actually regulate the relationship. Right now, if you're a homosexual couple, the government essentially does not regulate you. You, you are free to do whatever it is that you want with regard to your relationship. The, uh, the, inter the eccentric thing that the LGBT community is asking for is they precisely want the government to step in and regulate that relationship. You mean to say that there is no compelling state interest? Um, I, I do not see a compelling state interest, Your Honor, that, that would... Uh, in, in the question, the, uh, I would frame it this way. If the question is, uh, should there be a redefinition of marriage, then I do not see a compelling state interest to do so. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, homosexual couples are not... It's not it is not criminal. It is not... Um, uh, it is something that they're all free to do. Uh, it is not something that we frown on as a society. In fact, when we look at it this way, I mean, it's even unclear to me, Your Honor, and I, and I mean this with no malice to all the sectors of society and what have you, it's even unclear to me why they are considered as a minority or discriminated sector. They clearly have leadership in media. They clearly have leadership in business, in politics. Um, they can make the mayor of Manila conduct a gay pride parade, whereas all other sectors cannot do so. I mean, they can make multinationals create entire marketing programs to support their cause. For me, I, I do not see how can that be a discriminated or a minority uh, sector in society when they are already holding so much power and, and influence in our society. Uh, from your answers earlier, uh, it seems that you are an, or an originalist or a textualist. Uh, originalist, Your Honor. Originalist. Yes, and that, but you answered or you replied earlier that you consider the intent of the framers merely a secondary. Am I correct? Yes. No, Your Honor. I'd be sorry, Your Honor. Uh -huh. Because uh, you were asked that and you said it's only secondary. And you want to prefer the intent of the you prefer the intention of the electorate. So how can you gauge the intention of the in electorate um, over the uh, intent of the framers? Uh, your, your, your Honor, what I meant was that if there is a question that comes up with regard to the Constitution, the first thing is to look at the text. If the text is clear and, makes, uh, and, and permits no ambiguity, then we, should, we just apply the text. But if the text does lend itself to an ambiguity, then I think the next step would be to look at the intent of the framers. But for me, the framers of the Constitution is the, is the Filipino people, not the Constitutional Commission, because they're the ones who authored it, and we can see that in the preamble. So when we look at the, uh, what would be the intent of the Filipino people, let's say, for example, the word marriage or freedom, how does the Filipino people see or take to mean the words marriage or freedom in 1987, in February 2, when they ratified it. Now, assuming that an ambiguity still can't be had, then perhaps the next step would be to look at the uh, transcript of the Constitutional Commission. Uh, that would be, for me, the, the, the next step. But for, for, for as, as an originalist, what I do first is to look at the text and then perhaps try to see if we, one can get a meaning of the text from the overall theme of the Constitution. And if still that's not possible, then we go to the framers, which is the Filipino people. When you speak of framers, uh, you were referring to the Filipino people, not the uh, members of the Constitutional Commission. Yes, sir. I, I'm referring to the to the people who ratified the Constitution in February 2, 1987. So when you were asked uh, about the intent of the framers, you were referring to the electorate. Uh, yes, yes, sir. Uh -huh. And how do you gauge the intent of the electorate? Um, the, there are several scientific data that can be had. For example, in the U.S., uh, scientific? What, uh, scientific and historical data that can be had. So, um, in the U.S., for example, which has been uh, which has a constitution that's more than 200 years old, they are able to look at, at, at the journals, the newspapers, 
the memoirs, the fiction writing, and all the ways in which they would look at the word and see if how that word was taken to mean by the, by the American people when the Constitution was made in the 1770s. And that's around 200 years ago, so I think it will be easier for us to be able to discern what the Filipino uh, means, uh, which is around a mere 32 years ago. And so one can see that from either surveys, for example, newspaper journals, even the dictionaries which I presented, for example, in the oral arguments, um, they will present... Uh, uh, well, yes, but like, in 1987, I don't think there was social media at that time yet. Can you enumerate again what can you contribute to the Supreme Court? Um, well, I'm, I'm coming in as, as somebody who has uh, who spent his days literally um, within the realms of business, the academe, media, and even in government. And I've been doing so ever since I, I, I graduated from law. Um, aside from that is the further studies I've had internationally and even here in the Philippines. So I think I have a combination of both practical, both the practical, deeply practical, and deeply theoretical as well. Uh, and I would like to add something, and this is something also to, uh, to thank uh, uh, the University of Asia and the Pacific. Because the way the University of Asia and the Pacific manages its, its school is to do it by way of a, a uh, committee, the, the so-called operations committee of which I am the secretary. And the, oper the committee works collegially. We work as a body. And I have been, do I have been with the uh, UANP for a long time and I've been part of the operations committee for more than five, seven years. And uh, I have been trained consistently to work within that body, to work as, as part of a collegial body. And uh, I, I would have to say it's, it's not easy to work within a collegial body, but it, it, it for me, is a, it's a great system that works. And so I hope to be able to bring all of that experience, valid as it may be, uh, into, uh, into the, to the court. Um, one thing I would like to also point out is that um, sometimes it could be asked why is it that I do not apply first as a judge or, or but the thing is, is that I'm applying for a body that is highly constitutional and the constitution does ask for a body that is not only uh, members of the judiciary but also those who are practicing law. The past five or six appointees I think to the Supreme Court have all been part of the Court of Appeals. And uh, I think it would be also good, um, or suggested it would be good to have some sort of uh, a variety for somebody who's coming in purely from the private sector uh, with all the uh, experiences they've had. And perhaps one last thing, and if, if you don't mind my saying so, if I come in, I will be the only one coming in under the line of, I will be coming in under the line of four. Um, hopefully with a different viewpoint that I could contribute all the other justices are from the line of five above. Um, hopefully, with that, a different spirit, a different uh, viewpoint that um, hopefully I could share. And, uh, and one last thing is that in my entire life, nobody has attacked my integrity. Uh, you earlier mentioned that uh, you are going to provide balance. What do you mean by that? Um, well, a lot of the view, well, Essentially, it's just to be able to come up. To you provide. are a centrist. Are you a centrist? Uh, because you said you are going to you are going to provide balance. What did you mean? More balance in the sense that I'm coming in from a different uh, background. Um, I mean, the, the the framers of the constitution were wise in that they uh, they made the body open not only to those who, who practice law 15 years as part of the judiciary, but also those who practice law from the private sector. And looking at the lineup right of the Supreme Court, as I mentioned, six, the recent six appointees came from the Court of Appeals, and all 15 worked in government. If I come in, I'll be the only person, I think, um, who will be coming in as uh, purely from the private sector. Um, uh, I would not claim to have special knowledge or better knowledge. All I'm saying is that perhaps I have a different set of knowledge different set of skills and perhaps a different set of uh, um, perceptions uh, that hopefully I could contribute, not necessarily to make my way be the way, but at least to hopefully give a, a more overall uh, 
better holistic view for for the court. Mean to say, uh, you have a better view than the no. judicial experience. No, no. I'm just saying what I said was, uh, I have a different view, and I think. No, no. I I, I said. I, uh, sorry, sorry, sir. I did. Uh, what holistic I said. view. You said a better holistic view. for the court. By for the court, by coming in with a different set of views, uh, I hopefully the court will have a more holistic um, uh, view of all the, of the th of the cases before it. No, but Your Honor, I don't claim to have a different. I don't claim to have a better viewpoint. Uh, I'm just saying I have a. I may be coming in with a different viewpoint. So. What is your understanding of the rule of law? Um, well, it's essentially the, the, to be able to provide what, the, what it is that the law says to everyone uh, blindly without necessarily looking into the status or uh, background of that person, um, to be able to uh, provide what it is that the law says objectively. There are several technical definitions, but I think in the end it's fairness for the person um, recognition of his rights and objectivity in the giving of the provisions of, of objectivity in applying the provisions of law to that person. Book on international law. Uh, I, I co-authored it with Justice Natura. Okay, last question. What are the four universal principles of the rule of law? Four recognized universal principles of the rule of law. There's, uh, there are several. It depends on the author. So, uh, but but it's not really fixed in stone. But if I can say, number one is um, the fact that universally accepted. Okay. Um, several lot of several books. Uh, it's up, uh, it's applicable to all. Uh, uh, there's a objective institution applying. Uh, the the law, uh, a legislature that makes the objective set of laws, and um, the application of the law that is not dependent on the will of a human being of one person, but rather that the application of law is dependent on the objective set of standards contained in that law. Uh, more or less, I think that should be the four. Uh, it would be that more or less that would be it, Your Honor. Uh, on objective <coughs> set of that standard. will be my last question. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Thank you very much. Sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Wow. Your excuse. Thank you, Attorney Gadora. Your Honours, that concludes this morning's public panel interview. What time will be? 2 p.m. So resumption will be at 2 p.m. Thank you.